Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us today. Uh, Pastor Danny Hunt is bringing the message as today as part of our More Than Shallow series. I'm super excited for you to hear the word that God has laid on his heart. I know it's going to be a good one. It's going to be excellent. A couple quick things to let you know about before we get to the word though. Uh, as I mentioned last week, we got something special coming up for our church service on Sunday, August 21st. On that day, we want your stories to be the message. I'm going to be talking briefly that day about the power of testimony, about uh, the idea of our stories and what, uh, uh, what that does for our spiritual journey. Uh, so I want to encourage you, if you have uh, a testimony, be a short, like, one-minute snippet or a longer five-minute story, something that God is doing in your life presently or some major thing he did in your life that was really impactful for you, please let me know. I'd love for you to be a part of our service that morning and sharing with our church uh, your testimony, your story. So if you would like to be a part of that Sunday, please reach out to me. Let me know. Love to get you involved. Uh, Next thing, like I mentioned last week as well, heading into this fall, we are super excited to be expanding what we offer for our kids on a Sunday morning. We've seen a massive influx of kids and families in the last number of months. So we recognize that just having nursery and then one program for all the rest of the kids is no longer um, being able to give our highest and best towards every age group. So coming into the fall, we're looking to have nursery, uh, a preschool room, and then a school-age room. And of course, as, as I'm sure you recognize, adding more rooms and, and segregating the kids out in different areas does require more volunteers, especially more adult volunteers. Uh, so I want to encourage you now, just prayerfully consider where you can step into service this fall, uh, specifically in the area of kids' ministry. We'd love to get all of our people plugged in to valuable areas of service. We know that you all have so much to offer. We want to make sure you're plugged into using your gifts, your talents, and abilities. So if you're feeling that nudge towards service, feeling that nudge towards working with our kids in any of those three age groups, please let myself know or Victoria Williams. We'd love to get you plugged in so we can get set up well for our kids' ministry expansion come this fall. All right, are you ready? Are you excited? Church starts now. Hello, church, and thanks for joining me as we continue our series for the summer, More Than Shallow. When Pastor Danny and I were talking about this series and the the image that was coming to our minds, we were talking about the image of a pool. And how in so many cases, people just want to hang out sort of in the shallow end. doesn't require much energy or exercise. But there's something about plunging deep into the deep end of the pool that's so refreshing. And when it comes to the things of our faith, the things of God, we want to be the ones who will dive into the deep end and not just stay where it's shallow or where it's easier. Now, I grew up with a backyard pool, and it was formatted in that way. It had a shallow end uh, where people liked to hang out. It was great for kids because it was about maybe three feet deep. Uh, And then it had a long, sloping, slanted section, and then it would end in a deep end about eight feet deep. Uh, And so it was really good to be able to play back there We would host, our family would host so many of our like soccer wind-up parties, our summer barbecues, even friends' birthday parties, because of course none of me or my brothers were born in the summer, so we just hosted everyone else's birthday party during the summer months. And every single time we'd have all these kids coming over, and my parents would ask their parents and say, hey, do your kids know how to swim? Do your kids know how to swim? And all the parents say, oh yeah, yeah, my kid knows how to swim, my kid swims all the time, they've done swimming lessons, Uh, it's great. And so we'd have all the kids, and they'd be playing around in the shallow end. And even though we'd asked if they knew how to swim, just for safety, my dad would always be in the water with us, just in case, ready if someone decided to slip into the deep end and they didn't know what they were doing. When I was a lifeguard, I would be in there as well for, like, my younger brother's parties. And we were watching, making sure that the kids were okay. Without fail, every party You'd get the one kid who's just jumping up and down, bouncing in the shallow end, and they'd bounce closer and closer and closer to the slope down to the deep end, and they'd slip on that vinyl bottom, and boom, suddenly they were in well over their head. And the kid that we had been assured knew how to swim, turns out, does not know how to swim. Now, of course, no danger. It's all okay. We've got lifeguards in the pool ready to go, just a matter of feet away to get the kid. But before my dad or I could react, we would have three or four fully clothed moms from the side of the pool leaping to the rescue of the kid who's now floundering in the deep end. 
And it was always a sight to see them come dripping out of the water. No change of clothes, of course, so they're just going to have to drip dry. But when that moment hits, those moms jumped into action every single time. Now, going deeper in matters of faith is not as easy as just bouncing up and down and then slipping into the deep end. It requires work. Going deeper in the things of God requires focus, self-control. It requires a reliance on him and his spirit. It requires prayer. And yet every time we make the decision to go deeper into the things of God, we are choosing a good path. He wants us to get to know him more and to become more and more like him. Today we're going to be talking about going deeper in love, deeper in compassion for our fellow man, for love for one another. This is something that Jesus talks about a lot. In fact, love could be said to be the cornerstone of our entire religion. Love for one another, love for God, this is what it means to be a Christian. Jesus, when he speaks about love, he is very forceful in how he says it. He's not suggesting that we love one another. Jesus says very specifically, you need to be loving one another. And he exists as an example of God's love. Jesus' story is one of love, and he begs us to look at him and to take notes on his example. Turn with me to John chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 34 and 35 because I really want to hear Jesus tell us about this. There's tons of verses in the Bible on love. There's a smorgasbord to pick from, but I want to hear Jesus telling us about love because he is, in fact, the authority on the matter. So John 13, verses 34 to 35, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Three things really stand out to me here. First and foremost, it's that this is a command. He says, a new command I give you. This is not a suggestion. This is not a guide. This is not him saying like, hey, if you, if you're feeling up for it, something fun might be to love one another. He is saying, I'm commanding you. You must love one another. This is the God of the universe giving us a command we need to pay attention. Number two, he says, as I have loved you, so you love others. So we're supposed to look at him as our example. Our love is supposed to be a reflection of his love. He modeled it first. And then thirdly, he says that we will be known by our love, that we, people will know that we are his disciples by our love. And this is very interesting because there's so many things he could have said here, so many ways that people could know that we're followers of Christ, but he cuts right past all of those and says, no, 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 it's going to be by your love that you're known, not by the fish bumper sticker on your car. It's not going to be by the cross necklace you wear. It's not going to be because you just tell everyone. You can walk around all you want and say, oh yes, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I go to church. But none of that will tell people truly that you're following Jesus like loving. When we love radically, revolutionarily like Jesus did, it makes people stop and pay attention. They notice that there's something different because the love of Jesus is different. It's unique. And the love that he's calling us to have, it is our number one evangelism tool. If we want to reach people with the good news of the gospel, It will be through love, through our actions, through the way that we interact with them, through the way we talk about other people and with other people, first and foremost. So there's a lot riding on this. We need to make sure that we are learning how to love. And we're going to talk about what it looks like to love in the shallow end. We're going to talk about what it looks like to maybe start to go a bit deeper in this. And we're going to talk about what it looks like in the deep end. Because with love, there really is no bottom. There's no bottom to the amount of love that we can have. So we can just keep gaining this. We can keep growing in this. And God wants us to. And he wants to help us along the way. And if you're taking notes today, the title for today's message is Return Your Shopping Cart. We'll get to that later, but you can write that down now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I am so excited to talk about this because you were excited to talk about this. This is something that was close to your heart. And so, God, I pray that you would just start to write the truth of your scriptures on our heart when it comes to loving one another, when it comes to showing compassion and care. Lord, would we have your heart, would we have your eyes to see this world as you see it, to see people as you see them. 
Lord Jesus, we can't do this without you. So we, pa- we pray that you would empower us to love deeply in your holy name. Amen. So turn with me to Luke chapter 6, and we're going to, again, look at some more teaching from Jesus on the subject of love, because he has a lot to say on this, and everything he says is really good. Luke chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 27, we're going to kind of jump through this whole section, because, again, he just lays out very um, specifically how he would like our love as Christians to look. <clears throat> Jesus says, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on the cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now that's, that's a high bar. That's a really high standard to live up to. In fact, I would say that it's an unattainable one. In our humanity, we will not be able to live this out perfectly, and yet we are still commanded to aspire to it, to look at that model and every day be trying to grow closer and closer to this amazing standard of love and care for our fellow man and for the people that we do life with. This last section, the do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that is, we call it the golden rule. It's a core teaching in Christianity. It's one of Jesus' central themes of what he was trying to communicate during his time on earth. And again, it, it's not going to be easy. And when I talk about the shallow end, I, I don't want anyone to hear me saying that, you know, oh, that's the easy stuff. It should come very naturally. None of this will come naturally to us. Our flesh, our, our humanity rebels against a lot of this. The kind of love that Jesus is describing goes against our pride. It goes against our human nature. But it's always worth the effort. So the first question really that's posed here is, do we love when it's reciprocated? Do we love when the other person will love us back? Do we do unto others because we know that they will have a chance to do unto us. And this is, comes out in, in our families, in our friend groups, in our church. Do we love our families? Do we love our spouses? Do we show love to our children, to our brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love the people of Sunshine Hills Church? These are people that we do life with, people that we are in relationship with, people that we will encounter on a regular basis. And we have to be able to show love in this shallow end level because this is the easiest kind of love to show. Loving people who will also have the opportunity to love us back. That's the basic building block of how we learn to love more. We do unto them. We know that they will have the opportunity to do unto us. In my marriage, I love my wife and I choose to show her that love. And that's good But there is also a level of reciprocity there. Inside, I know that if I show love and respect and compassion and care for her, my life will also be better. And everyone who's married knows that is true as well. The same is true for my friends and my church and my kids. It's good that I show love to those people, but there's also this ease because I know that I'm also kind of helping myself out here too. If I'm loving to my church, they'll be more likely to be loving to me. If I'm loving to my friends, they will be more likely to be respectful and loving to me. This is the shallow end of loving. It's the one that we have to conquer if we want to go deeper. We have got to be walking in love and respect and compassion for each other, the people that we do life with. We have got to be examining all the time, am I really showing love to my spouse, to my kids, to my parents? Am I showing love to my coworkers, to my church? It's one thing to say, oh yeah, you know, I love, I love the church, I love the people here, but are we demonstrating it through our actions, through our words? Are we walking out love for the people that are around us all the time? Because we do want to go deeper. We want to get to the next level. And in order to get down deeper into what it means to love the way Jesus loved, we have got to get this one on lock. 
because Jesus has more to say on the subject. If we go on in verse 32, Luke 6, 32, he says, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get any credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. Jesus is pointing this out. Again, it's good. We need to be loving the people that will love us back. That's important. But he's also saying, like, okay, don't break your arm patting yourself on the back here. Every, you know, that's the easiest level is loving people that will love you back. So the next level down, sort of the, the deeper we swim, we get into the next question, which is, do we love when it won't be reciprocated? Or when there's no opportunity for it to be reciprocated? Do we love our, our neighbors, our strangers, people that we will only probably see once and then maybe never have to interact with again? Do we love our waiters at the restaurant, our barista at the cafe? Do we love our bus driver or the police officer who pulled us over for speeding? Do we love even the people that we may never get a chance to see again? There's no relationship. There's not an ongoing relationship where I can say, well, I'll, I'll show them love because then it'll make my life better and they'll show me love back. It's a one-time deal, and yet Jesus is still saying, no, no, you need to love them too. I spend some time online in one of the forums that I love to look at has really funny stories from people in the service industry, and it's for, like, waiters and waitresses and cooks and all those kind of jobs. They share their experiences, and oftentimes it's very funny stuff. But one of the posts that comes up time and time again with lots of comments agreeing just breaks my heart, and it's waiters and waitresses saying that there is no worse time to work than Sunday afternoon because the Sunday after church lunch crowd is their least favorite group of people to serve the entire week. And the stories are always awful. People are so entitled. They're not at all gracious. It's like they just left a church where they were told to love everybody, and they go sit down in the restaurant and immediately start berating their server. They don't tip. They're unkind. They're quick to judge. Church, that cannot be us. That cannot be our legacy in our community. We have got to be loving to everyone. And our culture really pushes us to see people, especially people that serve us, as disposable or not as people, just peons in the machine that serves us food or serves us our Starbucks. God is very clear about this. There are no single-use people People are not disposable. Every person we interact with, from the person driving in front of us on the way to work, to the person who made our coffee, to the person who sewed my clothes, is worthy of love and respect. And we have got to stand for that now more than ever. And we have to be the first on the line in being an example of that. We have got to be the ones who, in all situations, are showing love. Like I said at the beginning, that love that makes people stop and go, Something's different about them. The way that they treated me, I've never been so encouraged. I've never felt so valued by a stranger before. That should be our legacy when we go to lunch after church. Going deeper in love means seeing people as people, even when they may not have the opportunity to show love back. Now, of course, even in those examples, there is some level of reciprocity. I'm nice to my server, and in return, they smile. They're nice to me. I have a better exchange, even if I'm never going to see them again. There's a level of me still benefiting. But if we want to go into the real deep end of love, we have to start talking about loving even when there is no benefit to us. There's this post online that I absolutely loved, and it stuck with me for a long time, and I wanted to quote it today. It's called The Shopping Cart Theory, and here's how it goes. It says, the shopping cart is the ultimate litmus test for showing love anonymously. To return the shopping cart is an easy, convenient task, and one that we all recognize as the correct, appropriate thing to do. 
Outside of emergencies, there are no situations in which a person is not able to return their cart. At the same time, it is not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. No one will punish you or harm you, and an employee whom you will not have to face will have to come and put it away for you. You gain nothing from returning it properly. You must return the cart simply because it is the right thing to do. I love this illustration because to me, this is a non-Christian really grasping at Christian truth. Because when Jesus talks about love, he's talking about this kind of thing, where we are loving not because it benefits us. We're doing the right thing. We're treating others with respect, not because we hope to get something out of it, but simply because we know we are called to a higher standard. Do we love when there's no benefit to us? To put the question a different way, do we choose love when there would have been no consequences for hate? Now, in today's modern world, there's a lot of opportunity to hate without consequence. There's a lot of opportunity to show hatred, anger, all those things, and really never have to deal with it. Two examples come to mind right away for me. The first is with celebrities. The way we talk about celebrities, whether they're musicians or movie stars, politicians or the hockey referee, are we doing that in a loving way? There's not a lot of consequences if we don't. I mean, you know, I could badmouth Celine Dion all day. I could just, you know, tell horrible things about her to my friends. And very likely, I will never have to sit face to face with her and apologize. I'm never going to have to sit in a room with her and really feel the damage that my words could do. I could post about her online. But that's not the loving thing to do. The loving, the Christ-like thing to do is to treat every single person with love, even if we may never meet them. Even if they're well beyond what we're going to encounter in this world. Whether it's the queen or whether it's the person down the street, we have got to be treating everybody with love. So when we post online, when we decide to share our opinions with our friends or at a party, let's remember that they are people that these celebrities, politicians, whoever, even though our modern world often holds them up as maybe people that only exist for us to have opinions about, they deserve love too. <clears throat> the second example that comes to mind is our online interactions. The internet has created a world where anonymity is king and where we can just kind of say whatever we want with very little consequence. Whether it's sort of the shallow anonymity of like a Facebook group, you know, sure, your name's on it, but you can post in the North Delta Community Corner, comment on someone's post, and you're not really going to run into them and have to apologize. So just say whatever, right? Or whether it's a much higher level of anonymity in like forums or video games where you just have a screen name. It's not even your real identity. And I can tell you, because I do play a lot of video games, nowadays games are just made with an option to turn the chat off from the beginning. Because when people get together in groups where they're anonymous and there are no consequences for what they say, guess what? They don't choose loving, encouraging things. Nine times out of ten, people are choosing to be cutting, angry, and hateful. That cannot be us. It's very easy to do. It's very easy to fall into that trap. I mean, I think about my own life playing a game. I'm encountering people. I don't know their name. I can't see their face. I'm probably only going to play this 30-minute game with them and then never encounter them again. They might not even be from my part of the world. It would be so easy to just vent my frustrations and anger on them, to type something mean at them. It's not like I'm going to suffer for it. But that's not how Christ has called us to live. It's not how Jesus has asked us to walk out his calling on our lives, his truth, his gospel in this world. We have to show love to every person, even when it wouldn't benefit us necessarily. Let's continue on in Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus says again, <laughs> love your enemies. He repeats that, so we should probably take note of it. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. 
then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will be truly acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. The love that we are called to is a love that does not care about consequences or conditions. It's a love that exists regardless of the situation. It's a love that doesn't tally up the equation to try and see what we can gain or if it's worth it. It's a love that loves radically regardless. We have got to practice this in all areas of our life, from the shallow end of just loving those who will love us back, our friends, our family members, our church, to loving the people that we interact with only seldom, uh, our waiters, our waitresses, our our hotel concierge, anyone that we encounter, we have got to be walking in love with them and living out that golden rule, doing unto them as we would have them do unto us. But even further, we have got to show love even to the people we've never met, to the people we might never meet, to the people online that, that don't know our names. We have got to be loving in everything we do. That's the deep end of love. I take you back to the image of the moms jumping in the pool to save the one kid. Just fully clothed, no regard for their outfit, their hair. They're going to get out with makeup streaming. It's a reckless love, to quote a very popular song. A love that does not look to ourselves first. A love that doesn't look to our own safety or, or needs or personhood first. A love that just loves, that just jumps in. The kid might not even be theirs, but they're ready to jump in. And that's the picture of the love that we need to have, a love that is reckless, that is revolutionary, that is radical. Love is our way to show our faith. It's one thing to say we are Christians. It's one thing to tell people, oh, I, you know, I go to church. But what we should be doing is showing them that we are followers of Jesus because we reflect the love of Jesus. I want to leave us with... Um, a passage from 1 John chapter 4. And if you uh, are ever looking to learn more about love, go for John. John's gospel, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. This guy knew what he was talking about. Love was his area of expertise. But in 1st John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12, he says this. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God the Father, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. When we're choosing to love church, we're not just choosing to be nice, be kind. We are literally showing a broken world, God. We talk about shining the light of Christ, this is how we do that. Shining the light of Christ means loving as he loved. And that is his command for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your spirit. Thank you that you are here with us. Wherever we are, Lord Jesus, that you are impressing your love upon us day after day. Lord God, help us to love like you loved. Help us to love those who are in immediate relationship with us. Even the people that we, we do love so deeply, our, our own uh, friends and family. Help us to love even deeper. Help us to show it more. Wake us up to the areas where we can be even more loving. Lord, for those who are distant from us, for the people that we often just overlook, 
or don't see as people, Lord, would you open our eyes so that we may see the people of this world as you see them, children of God, deserving of love. And Lord, help us to love our enemies, to even show love to those who would set themselves against us. We want to love like you love. Now, if you're watching this today and you don't know the love of Christ, I want to tell you Jesus loves you with the same radical, amazing love that I've described. And as John wrote in his letter, he gave his life for you so that you could spend eternity with him. If you would like to make a decision to follow Jesus, to accept the salvation he's offering, you can do that right where you are, just by praying that he would enter your life, that he would be the Lord of your life, and that he would save you. And if you pray that prayer, and if you make that decision, please let us know. This is why we do what we do, because we are about in having people encounter the amazing and life-changing love of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. I'll be back next week as well. We're going to talk about going deeper in service, which really is sort of the walking out of going deeper in love. So stay tuned for that and have a great rest of your week.